Hello, my name is Linda Morris Brown. I'm a Senior Director of Epidemiology at RTI International, headquartered in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. RTI is one of the world's leading independent not-for-profit research institutes. Along with my colleague, Matthew Hsu, I co-lead the Data Management and Coordinating Center, or DMCC, for the NIH-sponsored Myalgic Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, MECFS, or ME for short, research network. Our presentation today will provide a brief overview of ME and the MECFS Research Network, followed by a description of our DMCC initiatives and how the tools we've developed can facilitate ME research. ME is a serious long-term illness that affects many body systems and often limits people from doing their usual daily activities. A key feature of the disease is post-exertional malaise, or PEM, which is a worsening of symptoms following mental or physical activity. People with ME also have severe fatigue and sleep problems and may be confined to bed. Other possible symptoms include pain, dizziness, and difficulty with memory and cognition. According to an Institute of Medicine report, an estimated 836,000 to 2.5 million Americans live with ME. However, the actual number is unknown since many people who suffer from ME have not been diagnosed. In 2017, NIH established the ME CFS Collaborative Research Centers or CRC's network as a coordinated network of investigators at multiple institutions. The goal of the network is to conduct collaborative basic science and clinical research to inform the etiology, pathogenesis, and treatment of ME. A basic research project may characterize cellular and molecular mechanisms of disease processes, whereas a clinical research project might follow a defined cohort of ME patients and control study participants. The initial network funded under a five-year cooperative agreement was comprised of three CRCs led by directors at Columbia University, Cornell University, and the Jackson Laboratory. The RTI-led DMCC, and advocacy partners solve ME and ME action. More recently, we added another research partner, the interdisciplinary Canadian collaborative I Can See ME Research Network. The DMCC supports network research by providing administrative management and logistics and expertise in data management and data analytics. In addition, we foster collaborations with the broader ME community. The DMCC assisted early career investigators, ME research, and the ME community by supporting three key initiatives. To increase the pipeline of early career investigators, or ECIs, we established an ECI webpage on a subdomain of the network website and developed a red cap survey to assess ECI's perceptions of their professional development and research training needs. In addition, we participated in planning meetings for the Thinking the Future meeting held at NIH in April 2019 and provided travel awards for three ECIs selected by NIH to attend. We also provided seven travel awards for ECIs to attend the United Kingdom Invest in ME meeting in May, 2019. The DMCC fostered a collaboration between the Jackson Laboratory 
and Cornell University CRCs by providing support for metabolomic analysis to ensure comparability of results. In May 2020, Solve ME launched the U plus Me Registry and Biobank with an integrated symptom tracking app. The app fosters patient-centered research by collecting longitudinal health information from people with ME and control volunteers. The DMCC provided funding to support the design phase of the app that included the completion of informational interviews of people with ME, caregivers, clinicians, and researchers. Programming and testing to build versions one and two of the app to improve the user experience and add new capabilities and features. The design and build out of a web-based portal that anchored the registry survey-based data collection and integrated with the app data. And finally, communication efforts to promote the registry to community members, including the design and creation of youandmeregistry.com. Currently, we provide support to Columbia University Center for Solutions for MECFS to expand the network's community outreach and engagement approach. This support has enabled three activities. The first is the formation of the Network Community Advisory Committee, or CAC. The CAC includes 15 members from the ME community, including representatives from our advocacy partner organizations, Solve ME and ME Action, people living with ME, and caregivers from the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, and New Zealand. The second is the establishment of the Network Communications Hub. The hub encourages cross-promotion and increases online exposure of network developments and findings by allowing information to be rapidly and broadly distributed. The hub has representatives from all CRC network partners and the DMCC. The third is this network-wide webinar series. The DMCC established three major tools to facilitate ME collaboration and communication and enhance data sharing. MECFSNet, our network website, Map MECFS, and Search MECFS. The network website was developed with assistance from a multi-partner working group to address concerns of the ME community. Careful attention was paid to the color palette and design to be accessible to persons with ME. The news and events page highlights events of interest to researchers in the broader ME community and news related to our network. The network partner map shows the location of each research center with a colored star and their collaborating partners in the United States, Canada, and New Zealand with a colored dot. The network website also provides answers to frequently asked questions related to ME. The Get Involved page describes network research studies and whether they are actively recruiting study participants. The Resources page provides extensive resources for both ME researchers and the ME community. Finally, we have a page dedicated to our research tools, Map MECFS and Search MECFS. I will now hand the presentation over to Matt so we can demonstrate these tools and explain how they can be used to enable ME research. Thank you, Linda, and hello, everyone. 
My name is Matt Shu, and I'm a senior bioinformatician at RTI International. I'm also the co-lead of the MECFS Research Network Data Management and Coordinating Center. And today it's my pleasure to present two online tools that our team has developed to support MECFS researchers around the globe and hasten the pace of meaningful discoveries in this field. I'll begin by talking about our data portal for integrating data across a wide variety of clinical data types called MAP-MECFS. And I'll start by talking about the motivation for this important tool. As we know, multiple, multiple systems are implicated in and are affected by MECFS. This includes the human immune system, uh, our genetics and epigenetics, our environment, cellular metabolism, the nervous system, and also the microbiome. We have the ability today to probe deeply into any one of these different systems through new technologies. However, with this ability comes new challenges for researchers. For example, the types of machines we use to probe into the immune system versus the microbiome versus the nervous system are all very, very different. And the data that comes out of those machines is quite different as well. Harmonizing data formats and understanding the results across domains is a major challenge for researchers looking to get a complete picture of the disease or human biology. A second challenge is that with all the technologies listed previously, we have the ability to generate tremendous amounts of data. However, we are only, we're typically limited in our reporting to only look at the top results. While looking at the top results of any given study is very important for moving the field forward, but this limitation of, present, of presenting just a fraction of the total amount of data really limits researchers who are interested in getting a better understanding of the full profile of data that was collected in the given study. Finally, as researchers are trying to compare data across study to gain statistical power, it's critical that they understand that the data that they're trying to compare is in fact comparable based on the study parameters that were used to design the experiment. For example, it's critical for researchers to understand the tissues that were sampled in designing a particular experiment or how other researchers defined uh, their cases that were selected. All these criteria need to be accessible immediately to facilitate fast research and better understanding of this disease. Our solution for putting all this information at the fingertips of researchers was to create a single online data portal called MAPMECFS that has the ability to house data types from across the biological spectrum and immediately present researchers with the key metadata they need to understand how they can take data that's available on MAPMECFS and integrate it with study results of their own. Our solution is to become a one-stop shop for MECFS research. In doing so, we created a space to allow researchers to share new data and describe the key metadata that they know is important for other researchers to understand their research. Give researchers the ability to search existing data sets and find data types and results that are going to be complementary to their, their own research endeavors. Create tools that allow researchers to probe very deeply into study results and identify statistical signals from different molecules that would inform the choices of future study designs or confirm uh, hypotheses that they have from their own experiments. And finally, download relevant files as they identify data that's going to be really useful in future analyses that they want to run. Obviously, with the amount of data that's on MAPMECFS, it's important to prioritize data security, and we do so in a few ways. First of all, all users on MAPMECFS have to go through a rigorous uh, approval process where they submit the reasons for their need for access to do MECFS related research to the NIH for approval. Additionally, any data that these researchers share on mapping MECFS goes through a set of quality control checks to assure that data files do not contain any personally identifiable information from participants. After being online for our network for over two years and more globally for a year, we have collected data sets across multiple domains, including gene expression signatures, immune cell profiles, microbiome profiles, cytokine measures, and metabolite differences across different MECFS and case control studies. Going forward, our intent is to continue this curation process to expand the available resources we offer. 
uh, to add tools like visualizations to our uh, portal, to improve existing tools to make them uh, more intuitive and more usable for scientists, add capabilities to include more data types that researchers may be studying, uh, continue to work with our user base to improve the features that exist in the site, and importantly, share the updates of our portal with the broader research community. Our goal in MAPM ECFS is to facilitate connections across scientific domains and offer a forum for, comprehensive, uh, for sharing comprehensive study results. Um, our team is committed to building new tools that allow researchers to generate new insights, and our ultimate goal is to accelerate the discovery of uh, MECFS research. So that's a bit about Map MECFS, uh, which is again a data sharing portal for sharing multi omic studies across different different disciplines. The next tool I'll talk about is Search MECFS, which takes part, which really focuses on a different part of our scientific process, and that it's a data query tool that allows researchers to understand important features of biospecimens that are available for their for new studies through a thoughtful and intuitive study design portal. So Search MECFS is an interactive online search tool that helps researchers navigate uh, available biospecimens uh, to facilitate new MECFS research. The goal is to allow researchers to understand what data sets are available, what biospecimens are available prior to uh, beginning their studies and to facilitate thoughtful study design uh, and hasten the pace of research. Right now, the current uh, biospecimen repository that is uh, under the umbrella of MAPM ECFS was provided by the Hutchinson Family Foundation and contains 201 MECFS cases and biospecimens from 200 MEC control samples. The biospecimens are housed at the NANDS Biosyn repository and contain uh, samples including DNA, PBMCs, plasma, saliva, tears, uh, serum, and urine. And we've created an entire framework for accessing the key metadata about these samples, extracting and requesting uh, sample use for the study design, and then ultimately sharing the data from these studies uh, using our suite of MAPM ECFS and Search ME CFS tools that RTI International created. So here's a quick little demo of what it looks like when you log on to Search. Um, as you can see, it's password protected, so only registered users are allowed to access it. Um, there's an intuitive query tool allowing use, users to select the type of samples they want to use. They can add additional criteria using the add rule button. And so in this case, if you want to add uh, the criteria that we need DNA samples from our MECFS case or control, we can do that. And you can add as many rules as you need to further narrow your search for biospecimens. Once your search is complete, you can hit the search button and you'll see the total number of specimens from the total number of participants that are available and scroll through to see a more complete table of all the available aliquots that you are available for your study. Once you're completed, you can create a, export this list to create a inventory request sheet um, that the user would then send to Biosend repository um, for approval, a review and approval of the study design from our Biospecimen Resource Access Committee or BRAC. Um, and upon review and approval, they would then send the researcher the requested samples for their study. And then the users would be committed to sharing the results of that study on MAPM ECFS to do the full unblinding of the case control status. So in summary, the overall objectives of, MAP, of search MECFS are to facilitate effective study design and biospecimen selection based on the participants, phenotypic and clinical attributes. Our technology and workflow enable researchers to determine biospecimen availability prior to formally requesting samples. And this ultimately simplifies the transition process of querying data to getting the biospecimens for your experiments. And then our process of sharing data on MAPM ECFS encourages broader sharing of these results. If you'd like to learn more about these DMCC tools that we've developed, um, as we mentioned before, we are online and each of our tools, Search MECFS and Map MECFS, has dedicated support teams that are available via email. You can also learn more about upcoming presentations and other releases 
on our network website at mecfs.rti.org. Thank you very much for your time and we look forward to your questions. Hi everyone and welcome to our Q&A with RTI. Um, I, my name is Sabrina Poirier and I am a member of the Community Advisory Committee um, for the NIH MECFS Research Network. I represent ICAN CME, the Canadian member of the NIH network, and I'm also an active patient partner in research and a patient advocate. Um, I'm so happy to be given the opportunity to speak with the RTI team today and to ask them some questions um, following that wonderful video we just watched. And so I'm going to get started with intros first and then we'll get into the questions. So Linda, would you like to introduce yourself first? Yeah, so to remind you, uh, my name is Linda Morris Brown and I'm a Senior Director of Epidemiology at RTI. And along with Matt, who will be introducing himself again, I co-lead the um, DMCC. Wonderful, Hello. Matt. Hello again, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Shu. I am a bioinformatician at RTI. And uh, as Linda mentioned, I'm the co-PI on the Data Management and Coordinating Center for the MECFS Research Network. And uh, I'll now pass it off to other members of our team who are able to join us today. My name is Tyan McMillan, and I'm the communication lead for the DMCC, which primarily involves oversight of the network website. Hi, um, I am Megan Carnes. I am the bioinformatics task lead for the development of the MAP MUCFS data portal. Hi, my name is Keith Legro. I am a systems analyst with RTI, and I am the technical lead for the search MECFS tool. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here with us today and helping us to understand a little bit more about your work. Um, so I'll start with the first question. Can you describe how you engage the community in the process of developing uh, your website and any other aspects of your work? And I'll go to Taya to get us started with that one. Thank you. So we engage the patient community while developing the network website. Um, all aspects of the website were governed by the Community Outreach Work Group, or the COWG, and it was comprised of MECFS patients, caregivers, as well as advocacy organizations, and we also had representation from our CRCs and the NIH. So combined, they provided invaluable feedback on accessibility considerations, navigation of the website, and then of course the overall design. And some of those key areas include the logo development for the network. So we had no, a number of planning sessions and we ultimately landed on a typographic logo. Uh, and that's basically a logo that has letters versus symbols or an icon. And the patient community shared with us that the color palette was very important. Uh, so the intentional colors were selected to ensure that they were bold and attention grabbing for the ME portion of MECFS, because we understand that ME, ME often gets the back seat to CFS. So we wanted to be mindful of that touch point. And then of course, all of our other colors, as well as the broader website um, is 508 compliant. And then in terms of functionality, we knew patients would be visitors for the website. So one feature that we added uh, was a window that popped up that asked returning visitors if they want to revisit the place that they last uh, saw or visited. And so this is one of those things of understanding we needed to go beyond those typical 508 requirements. An individual might be fatigued from looking at the website and they probably would not want to navigate through again when trying to find where they had last viewed. Um, other things, I, I think it was important to include uh, the patient perspective and the objectives as well as the overall goals of the website because that ultimately informed what would be included in the website in terms of the pages and content. So starting with the home page, uh, we have four strong photos that represent the face of MECFS as incredibly diverse from race and gender and age. And it was important to strike the right tone with those images. And even the language that we included after those images, um, MECFS can affect anyone, cast a wide net, wide net uh, because no one is exempt um, from it. And then the last few things I would mention is um, that perspective was helpful in identifying and vetting any resources that were included on the website, as well as making sure there was a clear area where an individual can uh, get information on how to participate 
in research or on the Get Involved page. And then finally, um, there's a tools page, which has been built out over time, but we knew it was important to include a way to be able to search for clinical studies, as well as published research for those individuals uh, interested in research that was happening beyond the network. So those are a few ways that the patient perspectives uh, were integrated within the website. Wonderful. Yeah, that was a really great point. And I think I would just add to, in addition to all of the great work you did uh, in making the public website really space that was inclusive to our patient community, um, we, you know, we piggybacked on that work in the other tool sites that we built, including MapMECFS and SearchMECFS, things like you discussed, the color padding, making sure that they were appropriate, but also we engaged with our uh, patient community, to make sure that we're communicating those tools clearly and in a way that was very understandable. Um, and then one other thing I'd add that was really, really important to me, and I think a lot of others on the team, was um, at our regular annual meetings, we invited the patient community to give their perspective and tell their stories and, and really just help us remember why we're all doing this work. And it was really, really important for us, and I can only speak to myself as a researcher, to be motivated um, to really be engaged with uh, the patient community, understand their perspective and why we're doing the work we do. That's really wonderful. So you've also worked closely with the Network Community Advisory Committee in the development of your presentation that we saw a little earlier. And we wanna thank you for that, that was wonderful. What has your experience been like and what have you learned through that? Well, the experience has been great. And if anyone liked the video, you really need to thank the Community Advisory Committee for making it as good as it was because we went through several iterations. And uh, in that process, what we learned was the things that we find um, kind of inherently interesting and exciting about our work as scientists uh, often need to be explained a bit more to folks that aren't necessarily in our uh, you know, professional uh, position. Um, and, and really, it was wonderful to get that perspective from the, the Community Advisory Committee so that we understood these are the things that you know that are exciting you need to explain to your audience. Um, this is some of the language that we use you know, in this community that we appreciate if you would use as well so that we're on the same page. And so it was really, really helpful to get that perspective. And again, I think it made our video much stronger and allows us to achieve a much broader audience in the message uh, that we're able to share. That's really great. So what's been your success in reaching out to early investigators? And maybe I'll start with Matt. Oh, thank you, Sabrina. Well, we know that it's really important for us to be providing um, some professional development and, and really encouraging the next wave of researchers to take on this really important work. And so we've been reaching out to early investigators throughout uh, our time in the Data Management Coordinating Center. Um, some examples would include back in 2019, uh, the NIH actually hosted a really great conference called Accelerating Research in MECFS, in which they uh, invited several uh, key talent and early investigators to that presentation. It was, they did a wonderful uh, poster presentation of some of the work they did and engaging with them, we, you know, that we understood the work that they're doing, the things that they needed, the tools they needed, and helped shape some of the tools you'll hear more about today that we talked about in our webinar, like search MACFS and map MACFS. You know, getting those individuals easier access data is one of the, the focal points of our work. Um, additionally, at that same meeting, we uh, created a survey for those early career investigators and, and got some really great feedback about what was important to them and what they needed. Um, some of the keys uh, that we heard back was, you know, professional development with respect to grant training, um, which was some actionable advice that we were able to pass on to our NH co colleagues. Um, and they recently actually just hosted a, a grant writing workshop at the AICFS conference. So, you know, that kind of engagement and feedback is some of the things that we're trying to really foster in our engagement with the early career investigators. Um, and, and it's bring, again, as I said, more professionals to this work. Right, and as I mentioned previously, we worked with NIH to fund early investigators to go to both the NIH meeting and the meeting in the UK. So uh, this was, you know, very, very appreciated, I think, by the young investigators. I mean, we, most of the people traveled internationally to go to the UK meeting, so. Um, we appreciate being able to contribute to that effort. That's wonderful. And how have you been sharing research updates and resources with the patient community and ME researchers? And maybe I'll start with Matt for that one. Sure, um, but happy for other folks to jump in if they like. Um, so again, with these uh, regular meetings we have, uh, we try and, you know, at the annual meetings that is, uh, we have the patient advocacy groups present um, we're making sure that we're sharing our activities on our network website. 
Um, I'll mention also that we're engaged with uh, many community action groups, including Solve ME um, and ME Action. Um, I'll, I, and I can remember one particular presentation we gave when we were still developing one of our tools, Map ME CFS. Uh, and again, circling back to the early career investigators, uh, we presented that to the Ramsey Award winners. Um, and the goal there was really to give them uh, a preview. This was before our site even went live of uh, you know, what was coming and, and some of the resources that were available to them. Um, and again, at the same time, uh, get their feedback on what was going to be the most important uh, features of that website to make it most accessible to them. So I think regular engagement through these meetings, uh, a continued presence online, and then, of course, webinars and videos like this. And again, I got to thank uh, our community advocacy partners uh, who have helped us produce a lot of this content, and it's been really helpful. Fantastic. Would anyone else like to add to that answer? I'd like to add a little bit about the website, which we talked about earlier. The public website includes a news and events page where research, news, and overall events are available, and past events are also available in our archive. And then we also work with Columbia University Center for Solutions for MECFS to expand our overall community outreach and engagement efforts. And so we're able to share information with the CAC. And then we also participate in the network communications hub. So we have a lot of cross promotion, as well as the ability to quickly share uh, and broadly share um, our information and any findings. Okay, so we're gonna transition a little now into a little bit more detail. And we're specifically going to talk a little bit about the tools that you've developed, which are search MECFS and map MECFS. And so the first question is on case definition. So case definition has been a contested issue in ME research because historically there's not been consensus on which criteria to use for study enrollment. Do the platforms capture which definition is used for study participation? And can a researcher search the databases based on case definition? And maybe I'll start with Megan. Thank you. Um, we do consider case definitions in the MAP MECFS system. When data is uploaded, we collect information about the study design and participant selection criteria, including the case definition. Operationally, we design the collection of that information to be as easy as possible, and those terms are searchable. And then to help researchers more um, where the case definitions are listed, we add a link to the source documentation that describe those um, specific criteria. Okay, wonderful, and Keith? Thank you. Uh, so the search MECFS tool currently contains only one data cohort. That is data from the Chronic Fatigue Initiative. Those data were collected from 2011 to 2013. And that study uses uh, two case definitions, the Fukuda definition and the Canadian case definition. So currently, there's no capability to separate based on case definition. But as we anticipate adding new cohorts that may use different case definitions, we will expand that functionality to enable that searchability. That would be really helpful. Um, so now I'd like you guys to summarize your progress to date a little bit. So um, Matt, if you'd like to start maybe summarizing and then we could move to Keith. Sure, absolutely. So I can uh, chat a bit about Map and CFS. Um, and so currently to date, uh, we have over 30 plus uh, data sets in Map and CFS. And I should probably kind of share that a data set actually contains a lot of different results files. So within a single data set, you might have hundreds of different results uh, that researchers can review. Um, we've also very proud of the fact that we've added uh, 24 different organizations and that number is growing uh, every day uh, and almost 100 different users uh, on the site right now. So that's really, really exciting for us. And, and again, uh, through opportunities like this, we seem to think yeah, I usually get a little bit of a dip or a, a bump in, uh, in user registration right after a big event like this. So thank you for letting us do this. Um, with respect to challenges we've encountered, um, you know, Map and MCFS is all about bringing different data types together. And um, one thing we've encountered is that we knew going into it that uh, the data type, so from an RNA-seq experiment is very different from a microbiome experiment. Um, but once you get into doing the work, you really appreciate just how different that data is. Uh, and, and the steps that you have to go through to make it, uh, to achieve our goal of making it as easy as possible um, to have different researchers follow the same set of instructions to upload those files and then have those files effectively talk to each other 
on our on our framework. So um, that was a lot of work, and and you know something that we continue to do and continue to ask our user feedback on how we can improve. But it's it's a big challenge. Um, one of the solutions we came across is this new uh, tool that you probably won't even notice until it's because it's on the back end, but we call Gene Tagger. And really it does more than just gene tagging, but it allows users to type in uh, terms that they're familiar with within their domain uh, and ultimately find any data set that it uses a, a synonym for that particular uh, nomenclature and bring up that data file in front of the, the user. Uh, and so what that means is that it's particularly useful for folks who are new to various domains that they don't have to be well versed in all the different synonyms and, and terminology, but just try and use the, the terminology they know and find the data that's most relevant to them. Um, and then a, a third challenge uh, that I think is, again, bigger than we expected, um, but as this is an international site, uh, when we started to think about the, the privacy of uh, participants, but also the privacy of users, we really had to get very deep in the weeds about data use agreements uh, and appreciating the fact that every country has its own privacy standards. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact, and I should really credit Medigan for this work, of creating a comprehensive policy that adheres to the data privacy standards of all of our in international participants. So um, thank you very much, Megan, for that one. Um, and yeah, it, it's, been, it's been a really, really great ride for us, and I'm very proud of, of where we are today. And Keith? Thank you, Sabrina. So we have a single study currently hosted in Search MECFS. That is the Chronic Fatigue Initiative cohort. We've had 11 investigators apply for Search MECFS accounts, and we've received a single submission to request biospecimens. We did not really receive, uh, encounter any significant obstacles during the development of Search MECFS. The biggest challenge was developing an intuitive user interface to allow users to clearly filter the data of interest based on their own parameters and data formatting to ensure that the data are presented consistently to the user. So I just want to add, in addition to the development of the tool itself, we did a lot of work on the back end. We obtained these data sets. We had to do a lot of um, editing to define the variables and make sure they were consistent. And also we worked with NIH to decide which variables we wanted to have as part of the search tools and which variables would just be available investigators to look at and potentially request as part of our data dictionary. That's really helpful. Um, how do you reach and inform the research community about the availability of these platforms so that they can use them? We keep the research community informed about MAP MECFS in several ways. We have a publication under review in an open access journal, and there's a preprint of that that's accessible to everyone. Additionally, we have presented at several conferences. And we keep researchers informed about the specifics of the site by ensuring that we have detailed documentation within the site. Um, we also welcome an open dialogue through our MAP MECFS email. That allows us to receive questions directly and feedback, and we can funnel that to the appropriate subject matter expert and answer those questions really quickly. Additionally, we um, recently conducted an hour-long workshop at an international conference and that allowed us to introduce the site to both new researchers as well as go into details for existing users. That's great. Um, and how has MAP and Search MECFS contributed to the larger MECFS research field? Yeah, so I'm happy to, to take a stab at that one. Um, so, you know, the, the major goal that researchers have uh, that we encounter are some of the major goals uh, are access to data and access to samples. And really these tools are all about reducing the barriers uh, for those and making those challenges a lot easier to surmount. Um, and so we're very, very proud that we've uh, created a large user base in MAP and a very growing user base in search, uh, which is evidence that people are coming to these, these portals, uh, accessing data, and then being able to take that data and make new inferences as they're able to combine that uh, with their own studies, or um, potentially they can just quickly validate or rule out findings uh, that they have uh, found on their own work. And so, uh, in, in bringing all, of, speaking for MAP in particular, and bringing that data together, uh, we have created an environment where researchers can test hypotheses and form new hypotheses more quickly. And 
accelerate the research in MECFS. So I just wanted to also add the contribution of search to the research field. So right now we have um, information and in specimens on about 401 cases and controls. So it's not a huge number, but it does allow researchers to come up with new hypotheses or pilot studies and to use the specimens that we've gathered to test these. And these um, hypotheses and research plans are all vetted by NIH before the specimens are provided. So I think this is a real uh, opportunity to move the field forward in different directions because we are able to use these specimens and the clinical data to come up with some real new data. Can you expand a little bit for us on the future directions that you've planned for MAP MECFS and search MECFS? And Matt, I'll start with you. Sure, happy to. Um, so MAP MECFS is very much committed to what we call user-driven development. So uh, this is a theme that maybe you've heard in some of the Q&A, but we're very much trying to engage with our user base, find out what features are important to them, and then build to that. Um, so some of the things that we've heard uh, from them, in addition to adding new data types uh, that researchers are applying in order to study this disease, um, adding some tools such as visualization to allow more interpretation of the data on the site. And so that's a, a big push for us as we're moving forward. Um, we're also always trying to increase the content and of course expand our user base. Um, and and uh, again, uh, trying to find even better ways to engage with the user community uh, more fully. And, and Megan mentioned some really, really great ones that were quite productive and I expect that we'll do more of that in the future. And Keith, did you wanna to add to that? Thanks, Sabrina. So yes, for search MECFS, we are looking for continuous improvements to the usability and the look and feel of the tool. We're accomplishing those through some regular internal review cycles, as well as soliciting feedback from our users on how use, uh, the usability of the tool. We're also looking for new opportunities to add NIH approved cohorts, data cohorts to the system and modify search functionality as needed to accommodate those new co cohorts. Thank you so much for that answer. And thank you so much to each of you for being with us today. We're really grateful for your time and the answers that you've provided. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, where should we reach out? And maybe I'll ask Taya. Thank you. So any questions can be sent to info mecfsnet at rti.org. And individuals can also access map MECFS as well as search on the network website on the tools page. Wonderful. Thank you so much for today.